I should begin uh, by declaring an interest with a name like Nadim Zahawi. I was never going to convince the people of Stratford-on-Avon that my family, my ancestors, uh, fought the Normans at the Battle of Hastings. Um, they may well have fought them uh, at the gates of Jerusalem, but that's uh, another story. <laughs> of my family emigrated to Britain from Saddam, Iraq, and we owe this country everything. The ultimate tribute to British freedom and British opportunity is that I can stand before you this evening a member of the oldest and greatest of all parliaments. Now, on such a combustible subject, it is vital, Zach, that we get the facts right. And the facts show that mass migration to these shores is a relatively recent phenomenon. From the mid-60s to about 1980, Britain was a net exporter of people. Net migration, the difference between people leaving and people arriving, only reached 100,000 a year in 1998. Under Labour, it then leapt up, averaging 195,000 a year in the 10 years from 2000. Labour's biggest mistake was not to impose transitional controls when the A8 Eastern Bloc countries joined the European Union. And you don't have to believe me, you only have to listen to Jack Straw. The public were understandably alarmed, not only to be by the speed of the change, but also by the fact that nobody seemed to have planned for it. We're now moving back to a system of managed immigration. We've introduced an income requirement for foreign spouses. We're limiting the number of unskilled work visas, and we're cracking down on immigration fraud. And of course, I support the Prime Minister's aim to reduce annual net migration to the tens of thousands from the hundreds of thousands. But where I disagree with my opponents is in thinking we need to go any further, for several reasons. The first is economic and has a direct bearing on where we are tonight. International students are by far the biggest single migrant group, accounting for 40% of all immigration to the United Kingdom. Not only are they worth many billions to the UK economy, they're also vital as a strategic asset. I have no doubt that future Prime Ministers and future Chief Executive Officers are sitting in the audience tonight. When you return to your home country and rise to the top of business and politics, I know that thanks to your time at Oxford, you'll turn to Britain first when decisions on trade and investments are made. We're already a world leader in higher education and we should be growing our share of that market, not trying to shrink it. Yet if we really wanted to bring net migration down to pre-1990s levels, that's exactly what we would have to do. The second reason is demographic. Godfrey's big idea, indeed I think Godfrey's only idea, is to leave the European <laughs> Union because we have too little power and influence there. The country that has the greatest influence over European affairs is, of course, Germany, owing to the size of its population and its economic muscle. Yet on current trends, ladies and gentlemen, the UK should overtake Germany as Europe's biggest economy, perhaps as early as 2035, thanks to our younger immigrant population and their higher birth rates. So if you really want to see a European Union run in the British national interest, cutting immigration to zero is not the answer. My third point is that the current arrangements make good financial sense. The figures show that unlike UK-born citizens, on average migrants are net contributors to the public finances. Douglas will probably argue that it's unethical for us to poach the most highly skilled workers from the developing countries. This is a serious argument. And uh, uh, far too few liberals have bothered to engage with it. But we can't ignore the huge savings we make by importing skills. It costs us an estimated £270,000 to train every doctor in our country and half a million pounds to train a consultant. The vast majority of that cost, of course, is paid for by the taxpayer. 
with 37% of NHS doctors having qualified overseas. A health service which only employed UK-born doctors would be vastly more expensive. And the economic costs of brain drain need to be weighed up against the crucial role played by remittances. The UK remits more than £2 billion overseas every year. Some of the poorest economies, like Somalia, are entirely dependent on money remitted by the Somali diaspora. Unlike official aid, remittances between family can't be embezzled or misspent by corrupt regimes. So significant cuts to immigration would cut off a major financial lifeline to the world's poorest resulting in stronger demands for government aid. I hear loud and clear the arguments about the economic impact of immigration, particularly on the young and the low skilled. Of course, we need to make sure migration is not undermining pay for those at the bottom. That is why I'm a strong supporter of raising the minimum wage so we have a level playing field for all. Yet the real culprit is not our borders policy, but a welfare state which paid people not to work and an education system which leaves too many of our citizens without the skills they need to compete. Madam President, ultimately what matters is not where someone comes from, but whether they share our values. The very idea of Britain, that fusion of Anglo-Saxon and Celtic identities, transcends the narrow concept of race. I believe in a system of managed immigration, one which delivers us economic benefits whilst addressing and ensuring that those who come here are not a drain on the public finances. Looking at the last 60 years as a whole, it's fair to say that we have succeeded. And Madam President, I urge you to vote against the motion.